Good morning, everyone. How are you all doing? Uh, so welcome to our Moving to DevOps Mode talk. My name is Daniel Bryant. Uh, I've had quite a varied career, just briefly. I've been an academic, I did freelance consulting, did a CTO role, and now I've moved back to more of a consulting role. I'm currently working with a company called Open Credo. That's the branding on the shirt here. We do a lot of agile, a lot of continuous integration, delivery, deployments, and DevOps in general. We, we help other companies move to that kind of mode of operation. So that's where my experience I'll be drawing on today, typically smaller organizations. Hmm. Uh, my name is Steve Paul. I'm from IBM. Um, I'm a very long time Java developer since, since it was tiny, and I've been doing it. And that's my day job, um, though at the moment I'm on a little bit of a sabbatical because I, I'm being asked to help a lot of products transition into a DevOps mode. So you're, we'll, one of the things we'll be talking about, the imperative that's driving this, and this is so real, you'll see uh, they've got people like me as developers mm -hmm. coming in to try and make some of this real. So I'm a developer, dev, DevOps pr practitioner. I'm still figuring out what that is, but uh, you know, mostly I'm here to get my products to change, and we're going to talk about some of the things that are related to making that happen. Yes, yeah, so our goals today are really about um, convincing you, I, th I think, about DevOps and its ability to extend agility and change across your organization um, and across your IT team in particular. Uh, there's definitely clear benefits. Myself and Steve have personally seen them. We'll talk about them a little bit more later. But we found there's things that are easy, things that are hard, and things that are plain terrifying in terms of implementation. Uh, and what we've done is a bit of color coding. We've got the, um, the green dragon for stuff that's going to be easy. So if you see a green dragon floating around the screen, it's kind of easy to get started. That's where if you're looking to implement DevOps, jump on that kind of stuff first. The red dragon, a bit harder. We've got the black dragon for the terrifying stuff. And if you see two black dragons, that's like the stuff that's Leave like... Leave the room. Yes. Yeah, <laughs> real nerve-wracking yes. stuff. So, in the beginning. Thank you. Right. So we're going to tag team this because that's just fun. So let's talk about why this is important. So let's start with a long time ago. So a long time ago, you used to have this sort of um, process. You have development teams that would code, unit test, fix bugs. That's the, the, blue, the blue box. You have the QA guys. They do their piece. You have the ops guys. They, do their, uh, they, they take the code that you've given them, and they stage them. And you've got customers at the bottom here, clients who actually use the code. And that's a fairly static model. And we know it was the thing we used for a very long time. And the piece where it got complicated was what we're calling the reality chasm, the difference between developers' expectations and ops' um, uh, the reality, what they found out. So that's one way of drawing it. And that's actually called waterfall, for those of you. How many people here use waterfall? Oh, dear. How many people here use Agile? Good, good. Okay, you're halfway there. <laughs> so, Waterfall. And so I'm trying to set the history here. So Waterfall, it c created a lot of the silos that we have today that we, we want to talk about how we get rid of and how we break them out. So you end up with uh, this dev development team do things, QA do things, uh, the, the ops teams do things, all very separate. And... What would tend to happen is, is that they'd come to meet in the middle and you get this really scary reality chasm where what they wanted to do versus, uh, sorry, what, what the development teams have given to the ops teams versus reality was, you know, could be out of the way. So let me draw it in a different way so that you get uh, a slightly better picture. So I'll walk you through this, okay, because this is just an example of how to think about uh, what you do. So the axis here, the bottom one, the axis is time, of course, and the vertical one is your perceived uh, um, vision of the quality of your product, or the number of bugs. So what tends to happen in a waterfall mode is, is it's not actually a nice little thing, it's actually a whacking great roller coaster, because you start off in the bottom with maybe an existing product, or maybe you're starting from scratch, and you would just keep making changes and changes and changes until you got to the top, up here, ah, where basically your product is not shippable because you haven't tested it. And then you would come down through this roller coaster and you would be fixing bugs, fixing bugs, fixing bugs. If, and at some point you get to the stage uh, sort of where you hit this first line where you start saying, I need to give it to ops. And that's when you find you start to panic because you start to get feedback about things that you weren't really aware of. If you're lucky, you deal with it all and you come out eventually the other side of the chasm 
and your client gets, a long time after you started, some value. Okay? Fair enough. If, unfortunately, you didn't actually get it right, then what happens is, is that the quality of your product, your perceived quality of your product, tends to go down, or in this case, is the number of bugs may go up, because you're now getting feedback about the, the things that you should have known earlier. Right? And so eventually, if you're really lucky, you get to the top up here where you've obviously got no value because you've got nothing to give to the customer because it's all gone spectacularly wrong. And probably, just after you've turned that curve and just shown that you can fix it, you get to about this bit, and that's probably where you leave the company. Right? Right. So that was Waterfall. Let's have a quick look. How does this look in from an Agile point of view? So an Agile point of view, we don't have that big quality thing. We don't have that big um, curve. What you have is lots of little bumps. And if you think about it, this is Agile. You, do, you start, you do something, you've got tests going along, you finish your iteration, your product is incrementally better. And you get feedback, right? And your customers get feedback. Uh, and though it would be nice to think that the moment, every time you have finished an iteration, you give it, you give it to a customer, well, actually, you know you have sets of iterations to get to the point. So at one level, your, uh, the value to the client is uh, further along. I mean, it's still where it was before. We haven't moved it forward. So what's happening now, this is where the DevOps thing is coming into this, is, let's go to the next slide, is that customers are beginning to realize what you're doing, and they're going, I need value there. I need value. I want to ship. I want it out the door, right? As soon as you finished, I want it out the door. I want it out the door. I want it out the door. And the problem is this thing in the middle, which is the reality gap. Right? The problem we've got is, and this is where the, the drive is for the DevOps side, this is what's driving the businesses, is we're saying it is possible for us to reduce that gap, and it's possible for us to move it to the left so that, that basically the client's value, you know, delivery to the client comes at the end of iteration, right? And when we're talking about value, we're talking, uh, in these modern words, we're talking not, hey, I've written some code, I've demonstrated it. It's out. It's being used directly by, uh, you know, your target audience. So our challenge, and this is uh, what we're going to talk about, is how do we get rid of this gap and how do we move it further on the, pro the pipeline so it's in your hands that the, uh, you know, the deployment technologies and things that we're going to talk about are about making it very, very easy for you to deploy the technologies that you're writing to the customers. Right, so I'll hand over to Daniel. Sure. Blake, so it's all about breaking down the silos. And Dan North touched on this in his keynote yesterday, actually. You can have the most efficient silo next to the most efficient silo, next to the most efficient silo, but as a whole process, there can be a lot of inefficiency handing off things, waiting, latency. And there's a big sort of notion around DevOps, around systems thinking, the big picture, making everyone responsible. So how do we break down the silos? This is something Steve and I have looked at, and it's, it's honest, honestly a real challenge. It's about creating a shared culture, a shared series of common goals and shared responsibility. Um, now, obviously, that's easy to say, hard to do, for sure. But we feel that through education, in terms of you know, brand bag lunch sessions, recommending videos, books, this kind of thing, will help a lot. And um, that will then help you instill a sort of a culture of continuous improvement and continuous um, well, delivery, which we'll look at in a minute. We also think, and to some people this is controversial, but we think you need to standardize on some of the technology. And I'm not talking about standardized technology, but throughout the company, all of you need to buy in and agree on a certain kind of backbone, if you like, of, of, of a series of platforms. And the granularity you choose to do that is obviously a tricky task, and it's kind of you have to look at each problem uh, in turn. But we do find this notion of, of standardizing. Th this primarily is the big problem of the old model. You didn't standardize. You developed on a MacBook. You, you know, QA'd on a Windows machine. Then you shipped it on CentOS or whatever. That, can't, that doesn't fly anymore. One thing I wanted to mention, I've, I've been to a lot of conferences, go to a lot of DevOps talks, and as I'm leaving the room with my fellow attendees, I hear all the time, yeah, this DevOps stuff, it's awesome, but we couldn't do it in our organization because. And I mean, yeah, some organizations will find it hard to do DevOps. They're highly regulated, or there's a lot of legislation, this kind of thing. Um, fair enough, but people say Netflix are unicorns. 
Etsy are unicorns. All the big names in the DevOps space are unicorns. And I don't agree, personally, but even if they are unicorns, you need to change your mindset. Unicorns exist, yeah. They're just a bit different than you might think. I'm sure every one of you can take away something today from the talk, and that will help some agility in your organization. So that's it. it's all about shifting your mindset. Don't think you have to do DevOps en masse. What, what does that even mean? It's about picking little things to improve agility across your whole organization. Culture is vital, and it's pretty hard, to be honest. I'm sure many of us didn't get into software development to do all the fluffy stuff. The reason we call it fluffy stuff is because we think it's fluffy. But it is vital. I mean, does anyone recognize what I think are four key tenets of agility, which is communication, simplicity, feedback, and courage? Does anyone actually know where that phrase comes from? Close, Kent Beck's original XP book, actually, Michael, but very close, he does mention it in that one. Um, for me, this is, this is it. Kent was talking more in terms of the XP practices, and whether you like it or not, that's debatable, but I, I like the fundamental principles, and I think now we need to push this further along the stream, push it into QA, push it into ops. Arguably, arguably to the customer, as Steve's kind of hinted at, they're doing it anyway. They want communication, they want simplicity, they want feedback. Uh, you've got to make everyone responsible for delivery. You've got to break down that mindset of, you know, well, works on my machine, that kind of thing. You can't have that. Uh, and it really is a challenging part of DevOps to implement. But we're going to give you a, hopefully a few references to go away and read. At uh, Flickr, I saw, uh, I think it was um, Andrew talking about this yesterday, Flickr were kind of the early adopters uh, of DevOps and they've got some great stories. So have a Google, definitely check out their, um, their story there in particular of how they started the DevOps stuff. Um, Sandro, our own Sandro from London, has got some, he's got a book actually, a great slide uh, set there of how he talks about changing culture. And it's not related to DevOps explicitly, but he's got some great techniques. He is very much a change agent. He walks into organizations and, and changes culture. So he's a good guy to, to get in contact with. And he's a top guy as well. He'll help, he'll help you if you communicate with him. The classic, obviously, we just saw it in the previous DevOps talk, uh, The Phoenix Project. It's a novel, but it's kind of got talks about DevOps. Talks about the three ways, systems thinking, continuous improvement, this kind of stuff. Even if you're not in, into the enterprise, I recommend reading it. I, I personally really enjoyed it. it. Took me like a week on the train you know, on the way home. Uh, and it's got some really good tips in there. And it'll help you relate some of the stuff to people throughout your organization as well. You need fundamentally to create an effective team. Obviously, uh, culture comes from, from a team, in my opinion, and it's self-reinforcing as well. Martin's got some great stuff, in particular uh, about habits of, uh, of creating highly effective technical teams, because it can actually be very diff uh, different creating sort of effective technical teams in comparison with other tr more traditional business teams. Uh, I like anything by Dan North is, is great. I'm a big fan of Dan North, obviously. But this in particular, patterns of effective teams is really good because it talks about effective teamwork in terms of patterns, which many of us, I'm sure, can relate to in software development. And of course, last but not least, Andre's reference there. We, we're, we're not sure if it's donuts or computer games, actually, but we say like, it's a great talk. And Andre, Andre talks about implementing continuous integration and delivery and getting people together by sort of putting some, something shiny in one place and getting everyone to merge and, and chat and, and share ideas, that kind of thing. Yeah, so check them out. Yeah, but we can't afford 150 donuts, so <laughs> work, yeah. it works in a startup, maybe, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, it's all good. That, that's, that's the fundamentals. That's obviously really challenging. We're going to look at that a bit more later on. But we now uh, also need to look at individual teams in terms of how to break them out of their silos. But before we do that, we'd like to kind of give you a, a backbone, if you like, in terms of understanding of the shared technology. And Steve's going to look a bit about that one. Okay, thank you. Right, so let's look at the pipeline. So we want to build a pipeline. Why do you want to build a pipeline? Because much as we can talk about cultural changes, you've got to have something to build on. And when I talk about the reality gap, I mean re reducing it, so what we're talking about, the relationship between the development teams and the ops teams has to change. Right? So we want people to work together because we're trying to figure out what the problems are and how to solve them. And, and the aim, as I alluded to at the beginning, is to remove this gap so that we don't, it's not a barrier to deployment. It's not a barrier to your customers getting value. If you're going to deliver very quickly, then you've got to be able to automate everything. So we've got to focus on, the, on, on building that sort of pipeline. So let's, uh, I'll let you take links to any, any of the, the books there, but let's, let's start with the simple one. I assume that pretty much everyone in this room does some sort of continuous integration, yes, or beyond maybe, right? So you've got to build a pipeline. You've got to have this. So everybody's got some source management system, some build orchestration system, something to build it, Maven, Ant, whatever, right, and some testing. So one of the takeaways from this talk, that, and I'll say it in other, t uh, other points, is uh, 
the way that you build this pipeline, the technologies that you use, that's up to you, right? Because there's a big imperative to fix this problem, but ultimately we haven't figured out what, what are the right technologies, and there are just so much going on, right? But you start here. You start with a continuous integration pipeline. I mean, anybody here not use, do CI? Anybody going, what's CI? Anyone that wants to admit it as well. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah, okay, so that's one thing. Now you build on that, and you have continuous delivery. Okay, so this is more complicated. So your pipeline takes the continu inti continuous integration piece, which is normally a tested thing, probably a jar fire or war fire or whatever. Okay, so now you need to automate putting that in a standard location. You need to automate the ability to take things out of that standard location, and you have tools for that. You need to start automating the QA, the wider QA testing. You need to start automating your performance testing. Right, so you need to look for tools for that. You have to be able to do this by automation. M minimal, basically zero, uh, human beings involved. Right? And you also have to think about the deployment tools that you're going to use to make this happen. Right? Because if you're looking at QA, uh, for instance, you, maybe you've got, static, you've got static servers, maybe you haven't, but you've got to be able to get these things in the right state. So you've got to start looking at the deployment technologies you've got to use. Right? Okay? So that's why we know Chef and Python. It's whatever you think is appropriate, because at the moment we can recommend, but it's still uh, you know, TBD, what is, what's going to come out of this. So that's continuous delivery. That's hard. Anybody doing this already? Anybody feels they've got a... That's good. good. That's awesome. That's good. good okay. So let's go. E let's just go to the next easy step. Continuous deployment. So continuous deployment is yes. I've proved my product passes the tests that my QA things do, and I've done that automatically. Now I need to deploy it to the place where it's going to be used. And if you're doing this internally, then you've got some deployment servers, you've got some production. Here's the handover to the ops team. Right? This is where it starts to happen. It's that line. So yeah, you've got, you, currently you can just say, oh, I'm targeting some machines, or SCP or whatever. Okay. It's more complicated than that. But you can see, this is where you've got to be able to automate that. So you've got to be able to automate the delivery of your product into the app server or the, uh, whatever your target is. Right? And again, you need to think about deployment tools. Uh, the expectation is, is that when you get to that stage, you've probably got a little bit of human evaluation because you don't want to just say, yeah, QA didn't find the problem, but it went straight through and blasted the customer. So you probably want something in there. But the point is, you still need to be able to automate all the way through to that point. Okay. Let's get even more exciting. So having got your continuous delivery pipeline, you've got to build it on virtualization technologies. Why have you got to build in virtualization technologies? It's because uh, we've, we, as an industry, have told our customers that, that by being able to target things like Amazon or whatever, they get value, and they, can, they will be able to get more value quicker. You think about the ability to fire up a server, deploy it, test it, right? It's the delivery process. It's the fact that you can take an idea to market through this process very, very quickly. And that's what we're selling our, our people, that's what we're selling our customers, and we're actually delivering it in pieces. And so they're now coming back to us and saying, that's really good, do more, do more, do more. Right? So let me just talk this through so you understand what's happening. Your continuous delivery pipeline, the, the green box, what's happening here? It's making calls out to uh, orchestration systems that are being used to fire up virtual machines fire images, going to AWS, you know, Elastic Build Cloud, all those sorts of things. It's building images on the fly. It's deploying the environments that you need, right? And then it's coming back and installing it. So for instance, you can see Jenkins. You might say, what you need to be able to do with Jenkins is, I need to fire up 20 build machines just to build this stuff, and when they're finished, they'll go away. And the reason that you want to do that is because you're paying by the moment for those services. You don't want to have these things knocking around. Right? So that's where we're going. We're going to the point where the systems that you want are on demand. If it's on demand, it has to be automated, has to be um, resilient, and it will be driven through these sorts of technologies. The takeaway here is this is already happening. The reason that we're talking about DevOps, the reason we're talking about Puppet and Chef and all these things is because of this pressure. 
Our customers understand the potential value that they can get from us. And our challenge in terms of the DevOps mode is trying to figure out how we make this happen. Right? And so that's why we need the pipeline because that's ultimately what we're trying to do. Um, and products, customers, clients, they want this to happen not in weeks, but they want it in days or in fact in hours. And I'll let you think about the scary consequences that you might consider when you can have your fix that you've just created out, in, out being used by your customers instantaneously. You know, there are some interesting. So what we're talking about is, this is about producing those, um, helping us do that transition. Um, it's a massive imperative. I'm here, I'm being, doing a new job to make this happen. We're talking about all these technologies. Everybody is make, trying to make this happen. We don't know what all the answers are. What we do know is the consequences to you are you've got to start standardizing. And it doesn't have to be standardizing in the same pipeline as somebody else, but you have to start getting this in your head that you have to have standardized, automated, repeatable processes. Uh, the scary bit, of course, is that you need the, the information you need about that from a development point of view, the education you need, are in the hands of the ops teams. So you've got to talk to these guys and you've got to communicate and figure out where that line is. Okay. Uh, hopefully you begin to see that as a developer, you've got to get broader. Right? You've got to learn new skills. It's like cooking. You, know? it's, you can go to a restaurant, you get a great meal. Now we're saying to you, yeah, you've got to prepare it yourself. It's not about buying the ingredients, it's understanding more. It's becoming a cook. Not fantastic cook, you can still go and get ready meals and heat them, but you understand your horizons have got to be bigger. You've got to understand the characteristics. And one of the reasons that that's important is because this tool, this tool set lets you run what you've deployed on your desktop. So you have no excuse to be out, not to be able to do this stuff. And we're going to be pushing you to learn these new technologies. So that's why, number four, <laughs> you're going to be leaving your comfort zone. <laughs> right, thank you. Cool. So there's got to be a chef joke in there, I think, as well, <laughs> haven't we, right there, quickly, right? So you've decided to make your move. I'm sure many of us have. We're looking to DevOps, looking to cloud, for example. Many organizations I rock up to have, have made that yeah. decision, rightly or wrongly, sometimes, to be honest. I've worked in each of the silos, each of the traditional silos. I'm mainly a developer, mainly a Java dev, but I do um, full stack stuff. I've also worked in QA. I worked in operations. I was a DBA and a sysadmin for a bit. So I think I'm entitled to poke fun a little bit at each silo. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to say the key problem I see with each silo, and then some tools, techniques, and methodologies for breaking those things down and, and basically in increasing cohesion across your organization. So I think no one will disagree, developers are key thing, you've, you've probably seen this meme quite a bit, but our key thing is throwing stuff over the wall. I, honestly, I walk into organizations on a daily basis and hear, works on my machine all too often in stand-ups. And I'm like, come on guys, 2014, you, you can't do that. It's, it's a big problem. And you need to contribute to the pipeline, like Steve was saying. The, the pipeline for me is your backbone of your organization, every, or, sh or e shared enterprise bus, if you like. And you know, that's a horrible metaphor, actually, <laughs> but sorry. But um, you need to kind of connect into it, and the pipeline is the way you do it. Uh, continuous integration, unit tests, integration tests. If you're using Maven or Gradle, that comes pretty much for free. Um, and you need to automate all the things. And as much as I found, you know, my Java knowledge gets me so far, I found learning things like Python, there's a great Groovy talk actually before this, uh, but learning scripting languages like Python, Groovy, Ruby, has been really helpful for automating the stuff I can't do in my normal build tool. So that's really good. Like Steve said, learning new things. Bottom line, when I go into companies, I say stop throwing stuff over the wall or you're next with a P45. That's what you got to do, yeah? Uh, not quite that harsh usually, but you have to get over that mindset as a developer. You must not st throw stuff over the wall. You are part of a larger team. And when you kind of move towards that, you need to move closer to thinking operationally as well. So there's a hint, actually, again, in the previous Groovy presentation, a nod to Michael Nygaard's great book. And this is a primer, really, of designing robust systems. I'm sure many of you are hearing about anti-fragility, microservices, all this kind of thing. And I'm really dialing into it, to be honest. But the way it's sold, we have to be careful with that. You need to learn the fundamentals. So when you move to virtualized technologies, when you're trying to become more cohesive across your organization, everyone needs to communicate more. And you'll end up doing more things like fault-tolerant design patterns, circuit breakers, Netflix, Hystrix is a great example, and lots of other cool stuff out there. Um, 
You'll also, as Andrew actually talked about this yesterday morning in one of the early talks, metrics are your friend. And I'm, I'm not sure it's entirely related to DevOps, but a lot of DevOps stuff does say you need to measure more and get feedback continually. So I'm a huge fan of metrics, um, both from a technical point of view and a business point of view. I've been using, uh, using Code Hell's metrics for a long time. Netflix has got Servo. Etsy have got Stats D. Take your pick, basically. Um, a lot of the newer microservice frameworks, like Spring Boot, Drop Wizard, and all that lot, come with it baked in. Spring Boot's got its actuator class, which I really love. So people outside of the normal software development are seeing the value of these metrics as well. And I've had a good example in an organization where I rolled in, we started doing technical metrics, such as the you know, number of logins, throughputs of queues, and the business guys were looking over my shoulder and they're like, oh, can I get the number of shopping baskets full? Yeah, no problem. And then we basically come up with a nice dashboard, which I'll show you a bit later, of business metrics. And that, that just kicked off a whole new thing, like Steve was saying, in terms of experimentation, learning. The guys were like, well, tweak this. Let's check them. You know, does that improve our throughput? Does it improve our conversion? Great stuff. You need to think a little bit more like a sysadmin as well, I think. Learn the Linux fundamentals. Mo you know, I mean, I'm, I'm not being biased, too biased here, I hope, because obviously some people do deploy under Windows. But Linux is, is more common in my experience. And learning about Linux in general will teach you a lot of things. In particular, I've found a lot of relation between Linux and microservices in terms of pipes and filters and that kind of thing. Doing, having a very much a single responsibility principle, one thing and, and do it well. Diagnostic skills. Uh, Steve and I were just talking literally before we come in the presentation about this, actually. When things go wrong, it's good to have a set of diagnostic skills, uh, uh, tools, if you like, in your, in your toolbox. And I found these really good. And in particular, um, Carl Rankin's book's amazing. It's a weekend's read. It's only quite a small book. But it teaches you as a developer to think more in an operational mindset and gives you some pointers of how to kind of learn uh, to dive into the actual OS. Uh, I've, I've found in particular um, NetStat and IOSTat and VMStat invaluable for learning what's going on when things are slow or not working correctly. Um, I'm not sure the final one, this is, I did this for another conference as well, I'm not sure that final one actually passes the, uh, the policy, the DevOps harassment policy, so ignore that one, right? um, the grow a beard, I found it can be useful. But, uh. No, I already had it, so it doesn't count. Yeah. <laughs> so, QA, now QA is manual testing, proudly putting the ass in quality assurance, I like to joke. 1760, the Industrial Revolution, we kind of thought that, you know, we, we, we managed to componentize and, and, and kind of get things on a production line, but we said in order to ensure quality, at the end of the process, we'll, ins we'll manually inspect things. You know, back in 1760, probably not a bad idea, but now, that's not really a good idea. You've, you've probably heard of the lean stuff, Toyota, all these kind of things. They're baking quality in at every stage of the process. You cannot do it at the end, particularly like Steve was saying, if you want those fat, fast iterations, where, where can we define the end? If you, you know, the end is literally every cycle, so you need to be baking in quality all the way through. And that's not just tests, that's code quality, that's architecture, all, all these kind of things as well. It comes down to kind of automating all the things. And this is a common theme between every silo, to be honest. But uh, I saw a great talk actually um, yesterday by John Smart, uh, definitely checking, uh, check it out um, on the video if you didn't catch it, about BDD and, and collaborative design. Um, tests can be specifications, and specifications can be tests as well. So it's about sitting down with your business and coming up with a series of specs for how the software should behave, how new functions should behave, and then feeding that back into the pipeline so you've got a continual set of regression tests to prove what you're doing is adding value and not breaking old stuff as well. You need to make these things easy for everyone to execute. Uh, I say make it fast, make it conditional as well. Myself as a developer, let, you know, if, we do, if we ignore the is TDD dead talk for a second, um, I like TDD. I, I use it as a tool every so often. I need to execute my unit tests very fast. I don't want a context switch. I want to be doing this all the time. So I need to perhaps only run my unit tests at one point. And then when I'm happy, I might run my integration tests. And then when I'm happy with that, I might run my accept acceptance tests. But I need to make things conditional in terms of turning tests. Well, not that that's dangerous, turning tests on and off, but turning suites of tests. If you ever use the ignore keyword in, in JUnit, I'll personally come and knock on your door, because that that's not cool. You must not turn off individual tests, but in general, it's nice to have conditionals on, on, on suites of tests. And again, contribute to the build pipeline. And a key thing I want you to take away from this, for if you're a QA person, because QA can be quite a, a challenge in terms of switching of mindsets, because QA are arguably the most away from the IT team in comparison with, with ops and dev. Um, if you want people to care, fail the build, and do not slip on that. Yeah, obviously, that's it's a case-by-case -case basis, but in terms of code quality, if you want your code to be all the same standard, which I think is a great idea, I don't care what standard, but I want it standardized so that we can read it easier as a team. And fail the build. Run a lint tool. Fail the build if someone checks in some crappy code. Same with architecture principles. Same with all, all the kind of tests. 
basically, if you want people to care, fail the, fail the build and point them out to, in a nice way <laughs> as well. Uh, just a few tools. I'm not going to talk too much about this, but a few tools I found useful of late. Spock, I think, is brilliant. Groovy-based testing framework. For me, it's the evolution of JUnit to some degree. It's a BDD style of, of testing, which I really like. I'm doing a lot of embedded stuff, particularly with microservices. You're spinning up a whole microservice, but if you're using a data store and you know, you're using queues, you don't want to do it all uh, on, on bare metal. You want to spin it up in memory. So I do a lot of like, in-memory Mongo, in-memory Solar, Elasticsearch, Cassandra. We do loads of different kind of things uh, throughout our company. Uh, what I recently got burned on performance, we were checking in code and gradually the performance of one microservice was degrading and we didn't know until it hit the critical path and then yeah, caused lots of problems. So now we bake performance testing into our pipeline. We, we actually, this example, we use JMeter, but I'm really liking Gatling as well. And, and John Smart talked about uh, plugging Gatling in with Cucumber yesterday, which is, is pretty cool, which I'm looking at as well. But now we've got a nice graph on our, on our Jenkins that shows the performance. And if you suddenly get a spike, you know, you know something's gone wrong in terms of performance is, is dipped or whatever or gone up, uh, but you also spot the subtle trends, and they're the most valuable. If you, know, you get a series of commits and all of a sudden your performance is just doing this, which is what we ultimately ended up with, you need to take action at a key point to stop that impacting production. So like Steve said, you're literally rolling, well, if you're doing continuous deployment, you're literally rolling stuff out all the time. And whatever you do ends up in production. So you've got to spot those trends. Mm. Uh, and, and just a little... Um, mentioned there, Jeb, oh Jeb, sorry, Jeb is really cool in terms of like Selenium. If you're not careful, you can make um, Selenium stuff quite fragile. Jeb makes it easier to make it not fragile. And again, I'm, I'm keep referencing, but John Smart's talk yesterday, you've got to check that out in terms of his, his advice around that. So operations, we got any operations guys in the house actually? Excellent, I like to make fun of the ops people, so it's cool. <laughs> um, so I think these guys like the policemen of our world, aren't they? Um, you know, they, they like to kind of, they, like, they don't like change. And, and they kind of like to isolate, and you know, heaven forbid you should need SSH access to a box. On production, no way. You know, this, I, I see this in organizations all the time. And I understand it to some degree as a developer. I've certainly had root access and done stupid stuff. Dan, uh, you know, was, uh, Dan North in his keynote was saying about the database stuff. I've done similar stuff, to be honest. So I can understand why this happens, but again, it can't work in a DevOps culture. What I, I've, I, I've seen quite a dichotomy, actually, with, with operations teams, guys and girls. Some of them, as soon as we, we roll into organizations, they're straight on it. Want to learn the coding, this is awesome. And then the other guys and girls are kind of, oh, no, no, you know, I'm, no, I'm operations, I'm, I'm not learning new things. So then that's a real challenge, I'll be honest. But the ones that do want to learn, pair them up with your dev guys. You will learn as a developer lots. I learned stacks about the underlying fabric I was deploying to in one, one organization. Uh, the guys, oh, have you thought about what happens when the network does this? Oh, all the DNS is going to change. I was like, never thought about that. So that as a developer was really cool. As an operations person, you need to get closer to, to dev and QA. Tighten the feedback loop. You're, as an operations person, an expert in the fabric and how things get put onto that fabric. And you have a lot of value locked up inside you know, your head. So chat to the dev people, chat to, make, make QA more realistic, make it more like live. That's something I often struggle with in organizations. The QA is quite far removed from actual live. And then there's no wonder problems occur in, 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 in QA. And embrace chaos for testing. I'm sure many of you heard of Siminami, Netflix's stuff. Um, it's quite a hard thing for, for operations people, to, to the traditional ones anyway, to switch into because they like uniformity. They like you know, everything to be just as is, calm, you know, zen-like. But actually, like, you look at the success that Netflix has had, it's largely because the chaos drives out the problems quicker. And then you end up with this kind of normalization of, of, of you know, stability. And, and a lot of the other companies doing the same, all the, all the unicorns, so to speak, Etsy, uh, Amazon in particular, they, they do some great stuff. So um, do, if you haven't read too much about the Simeon Army, do check them out because they've got some really cool, cool things there. Monitoring is mandatory. Like, in terms of the whole sort of feedback cycle, monitoring leads to measurements and measurements leads to feedback and so forth. Nagios, great for alerts, use that a lot. Um, AppDynamics is awesome, but a bit expensive. There's a cool, couple of cool open source tools coming up around that now as well. Um, and this is the kind of graph I mentioned before. I had in, this is actually a, a mock-up, but we, we had these kind of graphs running in, in an office saying how many uh, sh uh, shoppers were checking out and basket value and all this kind of stuff. And yeah, I know you can capture that data like a million different ways. You can use Google Analytics. You can use um, data from the database. But the metrics kind of gave us a much more free flowing approach to doing this, and, and it, was, it was very much a real-time view, and, and it, it, it was good fun for the business and the dev and the ops guys to get together and kind of figure some of these things out as well. Um, Netflix are amazing at this stuff. I know we keep banging on about Netflix, but they truly are leaders in this field, so you've got to pay them their dues. 
Etsy also. I really like Etsy. If you're ever looking at doing A-B testing, this kind of stuff, the, the, these guys are the leaders in that. Um, they're really cool. And I'm gonna, I've stolen one thing from, from Etsy. They say, when you're monitoring, you should graph, every, you know, graph everything that moves. You clearly want to see trends. Don't, don't worry if it's kind of, you know, you don't need it straight away. Graph it, look at it later. The second rule for graphing is if it doesn't move, graph it anyway. It might just be taking a break. And I like that because it, you don't truly know. I've been there myself. I've literally I've gone and gone, oh, we'll monitor that, that, and that. And the stuff that you don't monitor is the stuff that, that breaks. So monitor everything. If you see performance issues, you can switch it off later, whatever, that, that's no problem. But yeah, get into the habit of going, when you do your sort of user stories or however you do the work, go, what can we monitor here? You know, can we put some metrics in? Would it be useful for the tech guys? Would it be useful for business? This kind of thing. It's, it's a really useful thing to get into. Finally, in the ops, it's say no to, sto uh, to snowflakes. I don't know if you guys have heard of Ma Martin Fowler's Phoenix servers, immutable servers, effectively, are very popular at the moment. Um, so infrastructure is code. I don't really mind what you use. I've used pretty much all of the provisioning tools, and I think certain ones have certain use cases, which I'll happy to chat to you about later. I like Chef at the moment. I'm using quite a lot of Chef. Um, and I use um, Amazon yeah, CLI as well, Amazon SDK, I should say. But Salt's awesome. I'm a massive pup, uh, Python fan, so I really like Salt, though Salt was a bit immature in some of the bits at the moment. Um, and then, uh, as we hinted at earlier, play locally with some of this stuff using tools like Vagrant. Vagrant is effectively kind of a wrapper around VirtualBox or, or VMware, whatever you want to use in terms of virtualization hypervisor technology. But you can spin up things on your local machine. I, the other day I was having problems with a Hadoop cluster, actually. So I've, we created a Puppet script and we're running Hadoop locally on, on the laptop to debug it, all through Puppet. So we have like four boxes and then, you know, it's really cool, actually. We actually dive around and play around with it and not worry about trashing it because it was on my machine. That was kind of cool. Uh, Docker and Packer are getting a lot of attention. And I think for good reasons. They're pretty cool. I like the LXC stuff. It's really, really quite funky in terms of a, perhaps a more lightweight form of virtualization. And that's not really a technical term, but in terms of how people are looking at it. Um, I think it's in danger of, of hitting the hype curve too high, though. But I, I read a blog the other day, and it said, you know, it's gone 1.0 now. I think on the Docker Conf Monday, Tuesday, it's gone 1.0. It's gone in production. And one of their taglines was, if it works on a laptop, it works in production. And we've all been there, haven't we, to be honest? Java, write once, run anywhere. In reality, it's a bit different than that. Yeah, you can write a, a container that works on your, on your laptop and it works, say, in production. But in production, it might be different networks. It might be different hardware. So uh, be careful how you're being sold this kind of stuff. Play around with it, by all means. And the same with Packer. Packer is about creating golden images, pre-baking images with all the code and, and all the stuff so you can ship them out. You can run them, actually, on Docker and on Vagrant. So I'm, really, I'm, I'm liking Packer more than I am Docker at the moment, though Docker is pretty cool. So. So, why not? Why, why should you not look at the DevOps thing? Oh, oh yeah, sorry, I was asleep. Uh, so, yeah, so this is very good. So, we're telling you you really should do this, but uh, where does it start? So, how many people here, well, I asked this question in the beginning, I think the answer was everybody does Agile. Yes. You have to be there. You have to have that mindset. If you haven't got that, then this is, you know, this is all got really scary already, but if you're, not if you're not into the Agile mode and you understand those sort of imperatives, then doing uh, what we're talking about here, DevOps and the, the continuous delivery stuff is, is way out of scope. So are you personally ready? For you as an individual, how many people are scared at all by what we were talking about? How many people this see this as, I've got to learn new stuff and it bothers me? Okay, that's, that's, that's cool. And to be fair, yeah. at a conference, people, are, you guys are generally, you guys yeah. and girls are generally looking to learn new stuff, aren't you? Yeah. So that makes sense, doesn't it? Yeah. So you know, can you spell continuous integration? There's a hint, it's up there. Um, <laughs> you should, if you're not doing CI, again, then you haven't got it, right? And I've been to many products that I would have said, yeah, they're doing CI, when I've dug into it and going, oh, actually, no, it's a bunch of shell scripts. <laughs> um, and it's all very, you know, strange. So everybody, you've got to be certain that you know that you're in these stages. You need Agile, you need to have the CI thing because that's the start of the pipeline and you've got something to build on. If you haven't got those, go learn that bit first. Right? Are the advantages clear? It's interesting. I mean, we rush through this, but you have to think, as I said, the ultimately this is a business driver. The business is, and your businesses, your customers will be going because they'll all be reading the same stuff and they're going, oh, you could do something new for me. You can get me stuff out. So you've got to be able to articulate to yourselves the value of what we're talking about and appreciate that you want to tackle this. Right? And if this isn't, if we're not clear here, then you know, come and talk to us. But it's that's the, you need to be understanding that this is not something that's going to go away. We are in this stage because 
the wider businesses are driving this because we have, as a technology set of technology geeks, told them that we can do this. Mm. Right? So you have to remember that. Uh, and of course, if you're ready to make the change, then you need to be able to talk about it to your teams. You need to go talk to your development teams and say, guess what? You're going to learn some new stuff, and here's why. And the same with the ops guys. And the fact is that you need to be able to talk to each other and have a common goal. Right? And so, I mean, it's just common sense, really. If you can't communicate why you're doing it to these teams, then it's not going to get very far. And this is a scary, scary change for people. Right. Do you want to do the summary? Yeah, I can do, you do the summary. Yeah. Um, we'll both chip into it, can we? Yeah. So just to summarize, uh, a few sort of key phrases. We think, like Steve's clearly said there, businesses are looking to be more reactive. It, it's, all, it's in the media, be it the tech media, be it the business media, they're seeing what can be done. Uh, Netflix and all these other people are, are driving it as well, to be fair. And we think that DevOps and the cloud are the key enablers. And I think arguably microservices kicking in a little bit as well, but that's more a bit of a debatable point. But um, DevOps, we think, is as much a game changer as Agile was arguably yeah. more in that it crosses more uh, silos, probably. Yep. Uh, and also, um, you know, we've all looked how Agile went. Agile pretty much turned into a project management fest, didn't it, really, if you think about it. The technical stuff got lost along the way with Agile, the XP practices, pair programming, all this kind of stuff. So we're quite concerned about that happening to DevOps as well. So, yeah. you know, it, it'd be good. Yeah. So you've heard all this thing about them saying, oh, the develop developer is king. Right, and it really is true. You guys are kings. You are, you are, and queens, I suppose. And queens, so. yes, yes. Um, and thank you for that. Um, <laughs> where's they going with this? So, Sorry. so the point is, this is for now and for the for the few years to come. It's technology driven. It's development, developer driven. So you have to start thinking yourself as a developer. And you may think of yourself as a developer, but check: Are you a developer? Are you a Java programmer? Right. Do you use the right tool to, the to solve the right problem? Do you think that the technology problems that you're seeing are your problem uh, to solve? And the answer is, yes, they are your problem to solve. You've got to get wider. And so that's why we say renaissance, because in some ways, mm. the opportunity for everybody in this room, who anybody who writes code or is an ops guy, it's your opportunity, your imperative on you, is to go off and become a bigger, wider, skilled person. Mm, totally. Yeah. And, and as Steve hinted at, and I think it was slightly biased audience in some ways, because like Dan North hinted at yesterday, you guys and girls have chosen to be here at the conference to learn. So, um, but in the industry in general, there's a heck of a lot of people that aren't uh, interested in learning, Steve. So we yeah. think you, you've really got to get outside your comfort zone. And we've got a couple of recommendations for that in a minute. Yeah. But you'll benefit even if the tech doesn't survive. And uh, when I say that is in a lot of the things like be it Docker, be it um, you know, uh, VMs in general, the, the principles, and same with provisioning, the principles are more important than the actual tech. Yeah. It's arguably the same with coding, isn't it? The architecture yeah. and yeah. the design principles yes. are more important than the tech, you, than the programming language you choose. It's scraping back to the fundamentals. Yeah. Use the tech to learn the fundamentals. Um, and we think that, you know, the, the, this is more Steve's pitch, and I really like this one, is Agile moves you closer to the customer, but we think DevOps moves you closer to the IT team and the customer as well, ultimately. Mm -hmm. I really, that, that, for me, sums it up. You know, it, the business are driving this, but it's more impactful on the development and on the what well, the technical team, should we say? So, yeah, that's, that's something to think with about agile. And I think DevOps. Yeah. It? So just before we go to the last slide, let's just um, just reiterate: we need you. We all need to learn new technologies, but the important bit is to understand the right at the moment is whatever technology you pick, it might not go the distance, and there's nothing yeah. wrong with that, right? We're all exploring. We you know we were at talk just now about Groovy. You know, people using Groovy to deploy things. There's all sorts of alternative opportunities. Don't get ready to the technology yet. Just um, go off and start learning this stuff. Right. Mm. Yeah. And as much as that was our summary slide, we, we, we appreciate DevOps. You know, I love, love DevOps. And DevOps is very much a tech-focused conference. Yes. So we wanted to give you some takeaways to actually, you know, if you want to start learning this stuff. And it's quite sort of succinct takeaways, yep. but relation to our terrified, hard, and easy theme as well. So we think you should be terrified, but learn Ruby, OK? Yeah. Play around with Ruby. Uh, I actually like Ruby. It's really cool in terms of. But there's lots of cool things you can learn with Ruby. And if, if you're looking at Java 8 stuff, like Ruby's got closures already, so you'll be familiar with that thing. Ruby is really good, I found, for scripting things. And a lot of provisioning frameworks are based upon Ruby. So Chef, you pretty much have to learn to use Ruby. I've, I've learned enough Chef, enough sorry, Ruby to do yeah. Chef. Even Puppet, yeah. uh, I think, uses, you know, you, yeah. can, you can kind of call out. Yeah, Ruby, Ruby is things. the new Bash. 
Yeah, that's, yeah, uh, yeah, I think that's interesting. I like Python as well, so I'm a little bit torn, but I, I think pick one, basically, and yeah. have a play with scripting. Or even Groovy, because we are a JVM. You know, we yeah. should, I love the fact I'm a Java conference and say, go learn Ruby. <laughs> <But> <laughs> Get shot on the way, actually. Yeah. <laughs> um, we say the, uh, the transition will be hard, and, and that we think learn Docker. And the reason I put it in the hard category is it's, it looks easy, but it's a wolf in sheep's clothing. Uh, yeah. Using it well is going to be hard. Yeah, you can, anyone can plug things into Docker, run it as a container, ship that container, dump it on S3, whatever you want to do, uh, even Elastic Beanstalk, Amazon's thing are running Docker now as well. But to use it correctly uh, in a kind of microservice-y, bigger architecture is, is a real challenge. And as, as Simon was hinting at in his presentation earlier, if you're not careful with microservices and this kind of technology, you end up with a distributed ball of mud. I thought that was quite a nice, succinct way of saying it. So you've really got to think about how you use Docker, but do have a play. So how many people here use, have used Docker? Anybody? Oh, okay, cool. That's good. Right, yeah. That's, that's so, cool. uh, just to give you a, uh, we really want you to go use this because what you get out of it is you begin to understand the problems it's solving, and you get to see that some of this stuff is quite easy. So, for instance, this morning I was playing around with Docker, and I uh, I got a, do a, a Docker-based Jenkins server up and running with basically one line of code. I went do this Docker, and it came, it fired it up, and I pointed my uh, browser at it, and there I have a complete uh, Jenkins. Uh, Jenkins in Docker thing. It's like that. There are edge conditions, but it, the thing about Docker is if you start playing with Docker, you'll get to see what we're talking about and where we're trying to go. So even if Docker isn't the right answer eventually, it's the, uh, uh, you know, it's a great example of what's trying to happen. Yeah. And sort of nicely following on from that, yeah. I think Vagrant is an awesome tool. It's kind of how I got started. I was firing up chef scripts in, in Vagrant, um, running Puppet Ansible. I got a demo actually at a conference recently at Javaland. Um, someone very tiny half an hour and explain me how Ansible works. And I really like Ansible. It's, it's really cool tech, actually. Moving away from Ruby towards more of the DSL-based stuff. But the point that I'm trying to make there is, is, is Vagrant is a wicked tool to explore virtualization locally in the comfort of your own home, as they say, and without spending any money as well, because you can run it on your local machine. Yeah. Any machine will do, but if you've got a MacBook, you're laughing. I, so I, I spun up a Hadoop cluster, no problem at all. It was before Node cluster and was playing around with that. So um, it's, it's a really easy way to get, like Steve said, get, understand the paradigms, have a explore around some of these concepts. Um, yeah, I think that's, I think we'll, should we leave it at that? And we'll take, we've got five minutes here, I see. We've got, so thanks so much for listening and um, take any questions. My, my thoughts so on that it one. It yeah. okay. So is DevOps a new role or an existing renamed role? So was your question. Yeah, and, and the answer is yes. Uh, some teams, <laughs> so seriously, some teams are, are seeing the, the, the way to get the change is to basically take the right people from both sides and put them together and grow a bigger community. Other teams can get away. Honestly, it depends on the flexibility of your teams, and, and, and that's, the, that's the fluffy answer. I've had lots of uh, ops guys who said, I'm not doing any of this automation because everything I do requires the, quotes, human touch, and don't want, they don't want to know about automation. So horses for course, I'm afraid. Yeah. yeah, and I think it's an article, actually, I saw a couple of days ago saying DevOps is not a new hire, which yeah. I thought was quite interesting. Because yeah. I've, like Steve said, I've seen people more from the sysadmin um, world that don't want to come across to, to DevOps. But the other guys that are ops and are doing like Python and Ruby anyway, they're like champing at the bit to be a dev. Um, so it depends, and if you can kind of cross-train people in your organisation, I think it's fine to do it in-house. For me, it's it's not it's it's, it's really it's it's uh, unless you said yes, I was going to say it's neither. It's not. I, I don't think it's a department because you got Dev Ops QA now Dev Ops. That seems yeah. a bit strange in my mind, but I equally don't think it's a, a job title in some respects. It's, but but it is because we like to label things, and it's convenient to label things, isn't yeah. it? But uh, I think anyone like yeah. the fundamental thing we're saying is anyone can be a Dev Ops. Know, and learn. It, yeah, it's a bit weird because you it's could fine. argue that this is just a transitional phase because what we're actually doing is figuring out how these two groups to work together in such a way mm -hmm. that they never have to talk to each other again because it'll all be completely <laughs> automated and button pressed. So, I don't know. Yeah, yeah that's true yeah. as well. Yeah. There was a, another question. Yeah. Uh, yeah. You will definitely have uh, people who are proper IT specialists and aren't involved in this 
that's for sure. You, you, you're not going to say every single person you've got on your ops team is going to get into this because, you know, the fabric support guys, if they're doing SANS or whatever, they are not, uh, at this level, they're not involved in the automation drivers, right? So, yes, you, this is some people in the ops team who will be involved in this, not everybody. And I think from a smaller organization point of view, you'll see increasingly more and more people moving towards being DevOps. Mm -hmm. It's much like when I started my career journey, say 10 or so years ago, uh, we had like front end guys, girls, back end, and then database. And gradually that's been compressed. So the full stack developer and generalizing specialist. And I think now DevOps is gonna be bolted onto that as well for particularly for consulting roles and also for smaller specialist stuff. So, but for bigger organizations like IBM and so forth, I think there is more. Yeah. yeah. So I think we're out of time. So if you have any more questions, just grab us afterwards and we'll... Thanks a lot. Okay. Thank you. <laughs>